Thank you. Um, calling tonight's business meeting to order. Um, there are adjustments to tonight's agenda. The first adjustment is moving 7.0, our student representatives report, under 3.0, the public comments. We are striking 8.2 and 8.3, and we're moving that to our December 19th meeting, which are the meeting minutes for the workshop and our business meeting from November 21st. And based on the workshop that we just had, adding 8.5, a motion for the RFQ. Are there any other adjustments? Okay, great. Are there any public comments on tonight's agenda items? Seeing none, moving into our student representative's report. Yeah, so we have the Gender and Sexuality Alliance Club who are here to present. So we have yes. two officers. I'll let them introduce themselves. All right. So we're a little bit far in because this just got moved up. But Cora, oh my gosh, this is taking a while. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Spoiler alert. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. So. Who are you? Oh, hi, I'm uh, Cora Stewart. I'm one of, I'm a senior, and I'm one of the leaders of the Scarborough High School GSA. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm Max Bennett. I'm a junior, and I am one of the other leaders of the GSA. And our third leader, Katie Fitzgibbons, who is also a senior, could not be here this evening. She has work. She works at Starbucks, so like, she's got to go. And um, so basically, GSA stands for Gender Sexuality Alliance. And um, some of the goals of GSA are to create an inclusive place for our peers who may feel ostracized in their everyday student life or at home. And we want to act as um, activists for the rights of LGBTQIA plus youth at our school. And we also want to um, intervene in situations where students may feel violated and educate staff and students on like proper conduct in dealing with these situations. And because that's really important. And um, we just want to act as leaders in our community for students to feel like they can come to us and like we're there for them because I feel like students who are of this community who don't get a lot of support they tend to feel like there's no one who can help them but we want to be those people who can help them and I think it's important that we that the club is led by students because obviously in a club where there's just adult leaders there's a disconnect between the adults and the students obviously because one's a teacher and one's a student so with us I think it makes the club a little bit like lighter more fun for them we play lots of games at the meetings so like we have a fun time and um i think it's everyone that's in it has really enjoyed it and it's really interesting because last year the club was led by um dylan hinton you might know him and um he and everyone else in the club graduated last year so there were literally no members at the start of this year but he asked cora katie and i to lead the club and we were like of course so um we have done our best to start off like on a brand new slate we have totally new members and it's been kind of a slow start because the three of us are involved with a lot of clubs katie and i both were in peter pan so it was we had a lot going on but today we had a meeting and we hung up posters so like that was progress and i think we're doing pretty well so far so that's pretty great anything um mostly just to add on to what you said i mean i think it's insanely important for um, members of group that can frequently be um, either harassed or abandoned when they're at home or by their peers i think it's important that they have a place that can at least be kind of a nice pleasant time with people who at least share one thing with them mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, it's I a think, safe space. I think that's hopefully what we're aiming to create, and I think we're doing a good job at yeah, it. Yeah, I think so. Not to, I mean, I'm biased, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think that's everything we have to present. Cool. Thanks, Cora. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Cora, for coming. <laughs> All right, so to start with my part of the report. I just want to start by congratulating Jared Flaker and Ashley Sabatino. They were both named the Scarborough High School Fall Athletes of the Year. Um, as you can see, Jared was named for football and then Ashley was named for soccer. 
The visual and media arts department at the high school is currently presenting the semester one art show. So last night was the grand opening night. It was from four to seven, but the exhibits are up until December 20th, which is the Friday right before we go off for holiday break. So I encourage all of you to go visit. It's in the high school learning commons. And I just wanted to share some pictures from Peter Pan. I'm sure you can see Max in the corner of the middle one. <laughs> right corner. Like his great crazy. costume. <laughs> um, it was a really great show. I went to see it, and they all did amazing. Um, on November 13th, the Career Pathways Fund hosted the second annual health career fair at the Scarborough High School. Um, employees from Maine Health and Nordex came to speak with students about jobs in the medical field, such as physician assistants, nurses, phlebotomists, and lab technicians. It was a really great experiential learning opportunity for students who are going to be the future leaders in the medical field. And students from Mr. Translito's, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Eldridge, and Mr. Jones classes were invited to a personal finance workshop. This was hosted by the Career Pathways Fund, and students met with employees from University Credit Union and Town and Country Federal Credit Union, um, and they learned about savings, credits, loans, and investing, which I'm sure is all stuff that we can all learn about. Um, local scientists visited sixth graders. Okay, I thought they were wrong. So the sophomores, they attended an assembly which was focused on safe driving. The youth motivational speaker, speaker Kara Filler, came to talk to the sophomores because these are the ones who are just starting to drive now. Um, and they, got, they talked to them about how to stay safe on the road. And they got to test out a driving simulator, which looks something like the one on the left. Um, I'm sure we could also all use practice <laughs> with driving. And uh, the... Local scientists visited the sixth graders in honor of Maine Bioscience Day, which was on November 24th, and they got to see water samples under these special flow cams, um, so they got to see microorganisms in the water. And then on November 25th, the middle school had a Step the Bus Day. And that's um, and this week, the middle school is having an Inclusive Spirit Week, which is hosted by the Unified Club. Um, you can try and see what it read, what it says, but the Monday is wear white day, Tuesday was wearing hats day, Wednesday was color by grade, Thursday was wearing lays, and then tomorrow, Friday, is PJ day. And then some ratings. <laughs> so, um, these photos are from the Wentworth Literacy Night's green screen booth. Um, at the Literacy Night, um, Many Wentworth students were there, and they participated in a book swap. They listened to guest readers, played games, and took pictures in the green screen room. And as you can see, they had quite a lot of fun. Um, Wentworth recently held its 14th annual <laughs> Stuff the Bus Food Drive, where classrooms collected non-perishable food items to donate to the Preble Street Food Kitchen. And it happens every year. I did it. it was, it's a really great event, and I think it should go on for a long time. Um, after the, after the end of the food drive, Wentworth students and staff are now doing a Coats for Kids drive where winter clothing is collected for those in need this winter season. Um, Wentworth students shared ideas of what they are grateful for this holiday season, and the hall hallways are decorated with these banners of gratefulness. Um, Mrs. Tukey's fifth grade class worked together to decorate the cafeteria doors for the community turkey dinner that was held last Thanksgiving day from 11 to 1. And I heard it was a great success. So, yep, that's everything. So while they're searching for slides, I just want to say that um, as a graduate of Scarborough High School in 1998, as an out and proud gay man myself and as a member of the school board, I could not be more proud to see a GSA successful in Scarborough High School and to see LGBT students not just embracing who they are but serving as leaders is something you should be truly, all of us are truly inspired by and you should be very proud of. Thank you. Moving into 4.0, the superintendent's report, okay. 4.1, and enrollment update. So each month I come before you and talk about enrollment, and uh, I thought <laughs> I would 
try to show you the enrollment for December 1st versus November 1st. And as you can see on your uh, slide, the high school, um, again, we're up one student, particularly uh, from the last time that I showed this, and then the middle school, we're up three, and Wentworth, we're down one student, and Blue Point, down one student, and um, at eight corners, we are, let's say, in, so, no change. Sent, no change, and also with Pleasant Hill, no change. So when you look at the total enrollment compared to last month, we are down two students. Up, up two students. Sorry, up two <laughs> students. Um, and the good news is I think people know we're maintaining our enrollment. We expect to be growing in the future, and we're making plans for that. And uh, I'll keep you posted each month with the numbers, and we'll go from there. Okay. The second item is we have a proposal from Michelle Schopp, who is a Latin Italy teacher from the high school. And I think she's here to talk about a proposal. Welcome, Michelle. Hello, everyone. Could I have? Thank you. You can. We'll bring this back down to you. Yes. Hello. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Shoup. I'm a Latin teacher at the high school. Um, I have been a Latin teacher at Scarborough High School for four years, but I've been teaching Latin for 19 years. I started my career in Massachusetts, then Pennsylvania, then moved to Scarborough. And I do have two kids in the district, so very, very proud to be a teacher in Scarborough School District. So. Um, I wanted to show you our trip, our Latin class trip to Italy in the summer of 2021. Um, so where we will be going, this trip is called the Soul of Southern Italy. Um, I am a very passionate Latin teacher and I'm very excited to take the students to Italy again. The Southern Italy is just a treasure trove of cultural um, gifts to the 2,000 years of history following it. Um, this area in ancient times was known as Magna Grecia, so it was the earliest area that had um, peoples from outside of Italy uh, who came in, and those were the Greeks. So the trip will be from July 12th to July 21st. It will, we will visit uh, Rome. We will do lots of amazing things. I can give you a very detailed itinerary if you would like it. We will be going to Napoli. We'll be going to the National Archaeological Museum, which is where all the treasures of Herculaneum, Stabia, and Pompeii are stored, um, are displayed. Uh, we will be visiting Pompeii. We'll be visiting Sorrento, all of these beautiful places in the Bay of Naples area. We will also visit Albero Bello, which is the home of the beautiful, truly white homes that are among the oldest settlements in all of Europe, um, and a town called Otranto and Lecce. And Lecce is a really... Um, it's kind of like an untapped treasure of ancient Roman um, architecture. It has a beautiful sunken amphitheater. And also, for the students who are going on this trip, who will all be Latin students, it's a curricular trip, um, a lot of the events of the Punic Wars happened in this area. So they're all very excited. They're not excited about the Italian coastline or the food. They're excited to talk about the Punic Wars. So <laughs> <laughs> it is a curricular trip. This is tied to the Latin one to four standards and learning goals. Um, who is uh, able to go on this trip? So here we actually, so some of the slides have pictures of our students on this summer's trip. Some of you uh, were on the school board when I proposed the last trip, the trip that we just took this summer. Um, and these are some pictures of our students uh, on on this previous trip. So this is a picture up in the left of me getting to live my wildest teacher dream, which is of course teaching in the Roman Forum about the Roman Forum. <laughs> so it was super exciting. It's my favorite thing to do and it's just, oh, it's magical. Um, so, sorry, I get a little carried away. So uh, this is another uh, picture when we were in Rome on the Via Appia, which was the major uh, north-south highway of ancient Rome. Um, that was also the major gladiatorial pathway. So we go to an ancient gladiatorial school and the kids get to visit a museum with wonderful artifacts, but then they also get to gladiate, which is a very ex fun experiential learning experience. Um, for those of you who are on the board, um, when you have a chance, these two links, the one that says Latin students, um, on the last trip, uh, the company that we travel with actually highlighted our student trip because our students have a history of um, representing themselves well. 
So they followed us around and did a professional video of our trip with student testimonials, et cetera. So if you want to be really sad that you're not in Italy or Greece, watch those videos. Um, they are lovely. The second one, the one that says level two or higher, I just put them on there. That's a video of our trip to Greece. So we went to Italy and Greece on the last trip. So the students who are, um, to whom uh, we're offering this trip are Latin students who will be in level two or higher as of the date of the trip. So that's anyone who's currently enrolled in Latin. The chaperones right now are myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, this is really a passion of mine. This is my 14th student trip internationally. I've taken over 350 students. I do speak fluent Italian, and I used to live in Italy. Um, and so this is really my passion, is taking my Latin students to Italy and showing them experientially um, as opposed to just, you know, in books and with very exciting Google Slides, but it's not as exciting as standing in front of the Coliseum. And then our, my, uh, my assistant chaperone will be Magister Davis, who is, of course, the advanced Latin teacher at the high school. So does anybody, does anybody have any questions about the trip? Yes. Is this, is this through EF? No, this yeah. is through ACIS. It's a different company. Yeah, different company. Did you say when they need to, the students need to sign up? And no, but that information is coming out. <laughs> I promise that uh, that information will go out to all the Latin students. Um, we're going to have a parent meeting in January, um, and I would like to have them registered by the beginning of February. But the final payment is not due until the following May if they do automatic payments. And if they pay old-fashioned, it's due by the end of March of, the f of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I also have a budget plan for the students that I show them, like working minimum wage, this many hours for this many weeks, allowing for a couple of coffees at Scarborough Grounds that would totally taste better in Rome. Um, if they allow for a couple of those things, um, how they can afford to pay for about two thirds of the trips on their own, working part time um, to alleviate some of the burden on their parents and also allows for them to have about $800 in spending money. So I do show them that financial plan at the meeting as well. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Michelle. That sounds like an awesome trip. And if you need any extra chaperones, <laughs> <I'm> volunteering. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, I want to be disrespectful, but can we talk for a few minutes about what, we, what we're here for? Then we can all leave afterwards. Will that be an opportunity to do that right now? or? Um, technically speaking on this, we are supposed to speak to agenda items. Okay. Um, I am going to open that to the folks from negotiations of if you would want to make an exception. I, I believe we really need to stick with how the agenda is formulated because it sets a precedent. Um, I understand. We, well, we'll be very quick also. We have very brief comments. I'm, I really don't want to set that precedent. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Keep on going. Okay. Keep on going. Um, moving into the chair's report. Um, something that has come up on a couple of, you know, discussions that I've had with folks on the board is how do we determine what our official stance would be on legislative items um, as we start looking at making a formulation as new things are being. Um, coming up to our legislative members, how do we present our thoughts and feelings to those items? Um, so I just want to open up the chair's report to have this conversation openly on how we would determine an official stance. I mean, certainly one thing I could do as a legislative liaison is to reach out to our elected officials to get perspective from them as to what the conversations have been at the lo at local and state government levels. And I mean, that's certainly something I'd bring to the conversation that could help round out whatever we wind up talking about. I know there's something that's on the docket recently that, that's coming up, but it's important to have this conversation, so thank you. Um, and it actually led to the next question of what would happen if there's a dissension with the majority decision? So if we vote on something as the legislative representative, if you didn't agree with the decision of the board, how do we make sure that um, we're adhering to our roles as board members as well as standing behind our own personal beliefs? So I think probably it would be in the best interest of boardsmanship for me to represent the opinion of the majority even if it doesn't agree with my own. 
Does that answer what you were asking? It does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, yeah, I think it would just be helpful if our state reps could keep you in the loop when these things are happening and solicit our feedback. These, you know, particularly the one that's coming up now, I don't know how they can make a decision without some feedback mm -hmm. from our group. So I think just opening those lines of communication would be good. Well, it'll be interesting to know also what other forms of input they have. So they have their local school boards, right? But they also have officials of the Department of Education. You have people, I'm sure, in Augusta that are talking about this and, and lobbying on both sides of the issue. But to make, your, to make your point, I think it's important that our legislators who the public elect, just like they elect us, uh, reach out to this body as the, as the presiding body of the school district of this town. Yeah. Um, which actually was a great segue, Ann Creston, um, to what brought this forward, which is LD 1715, and it's a motion to move child development services for three to five year olds to the local districts. Um, some of the questions that first came to me as I was reading through um, the article what happens if we don't have a pre-K program? How do we support those younger children with a service? Um, and what happens to existing programs specifically for our district if the state isn't funding those services? As a minimum receiver, we're not going to get any extra money and how do we pay for the services that are being shifted? I'm yeah, I mean, sure there's the kind of things that would be nice to know from them if any funding would be outside of the school formula because that's the only way we're going to get funding correct is if it's money mm -hmm. that's not part of the... Well, when I read the article about this, this uh, one of the major drivers for this was basically an overage in spending by CDS for several years. So I would imagine, and I don't know of any information on this, but I'm just kind of thinking out loud, that if they're going to expect districts to pick this up, particularly districts that have no pre-K right now, and you want them to take on special uh, services pre-K, basically, <laughs> I mean, I would think that some of that money has to come down to the districts, but how does that happen, and, and what right. is the formula for that, and, and what does that mean for districts like Scarborough that are minimum receivers that don't have pre-K? What do we do with that? Yeah. I don't know. It's questions. That first round circle bullet is the very first question that came to my mind when I saw this come out in the article, and I'm glad to see it here. This is for 2021, I think, is what the law is. Is that the plan? Is, is it that soon? So. I thought it was later than that. They're yeah, I thought it was, I actually thought it was 2021 as well that they were taking the vote and it would be, it's supposed to be in this session. Because no, it, it was could a be 2021. So, so this be, is quick. Next year. Well, no, we'd be year after, right? Next year. No, you're right, 2021. Yes, ma'am. So I think, like, I mean, we have a legislative liaison, so I'm, I'm, I'm I guess I'm assuming that this would to you to like kind of open those lines and um, ask some of these questions but um, outside of that my understanding is this this is not an unfunded I mean CDS is not unfunded they're not talking about unfunding CDS and, and no. placing that cost on the district I mean they're talking about moving the funding from CDS to school so I don't know that we know that yet I don't think that's clear is it I mean I that was my understanding but that's what I think yeah I think before we can like have right. a true discussion on that, we need to have those questions answered. Well, and, and the article, I'm not following the advice turn mic on. Um, the article actually pointed out that one of the drivers for this was to defer some of the costs to one of the more, some of the more um, affluent communities in our town. I think, I don't know if that was the word they used, but that's what they were hinting at. So um, I have made a note and we'll definitely reach out. Leanne and I had this conversation earlier this week and, and I'm glad to have it here because I wasn't exactly sure what my role was in this. So I'm um, happy to reach out to our two state uh, officials and see what they know about this because the sooner we can find out, obviously, and we're not alone, every district in the state, the sooner we find out, the better off we'll be. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. All right. Thank you. Moving into committee reports. Communications. I think communications is pretty short. Um, we were supposed to meet on Tuesday, but because of the snow day, we are rescheduled. It's my last bullet, so our next meeting will be tomorrow um, in central office at 1245. Um, 
the next Spotlight Award winner will be announced and celebrated at our next meeting on December 19th. Um, going back um, to a couple of weeks ago, the fall issue of the district newsletter was sent to families and posted on our website on November 13th. Um, and so everyone who is subscribed to our district um, outreach page gets that as well as um, everybody who gets the emails from the schools. Um, and we have a pretty full agenda for tomorrow's meeting. Um, Kristen is new to the committee, and so we will definitely spend some time talking about kind of procedurally how we do things. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit um, as a full board about requests made to the communications committee. And this has come up before, um, you know, when we're not sure whether members of a certain you know, committee should be um, communicating information or whether that's solely the charge of the communications committee. Um, and so that's something that we will be talking about at the committee level and then kind of coming back to the board um, with a request. We're also, and then big, big things for us to be communicating right now are obviously the building steering committee's um, report that they gave us today. We're really gonna try and plug the public hearing um, or you know, spend the next two weeks really trying to get as much community interest as we can in that. Um, and so that is what communications is up to. Oh, no, no, I'll do that later. Okay. <laughs> Long range planning. So um, we had our meeting last night, which actually times out well because it gives me fresh things to talk about at these school board meetings. So um, eight corners primary, and I think there's going to be a little more talk about this later in the agenda, but just really quickly, there is a, a approximately $64,000 overage on the eight corners primary portable product project, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, some of that is attributed to regulatory changes. Other things are just some of the unexpected costs that come up when you renovate everything from a garden shed to a school uh, and add things. Um, Future portable use, we had a, we have a conversation about this last night because as we talk about um, a potential renovation, we talk about a potential consolidated school, one of the things that long range planning would be remiss if we didn't have the discussion about is what happens if we wind up not being able to do either of these things and what are our options because these kids need a place to learn. Um, and what we talked about and actually the, the committee did a more comprehensive job that I'm going to do about it here so I won't rehash everything they said, but basically even if we could add all the portables we need, we can't because there's no place to put them. Um, and so that's something that long range planning is talking about. We're actually talking about one of our tasks, our tasks being constructing a, a nice, concise, visual plan that we can present to our public if that comes down the pike so that we can show we've investigated this. We know the consequences of not being able to do anything. I think it's important that we uh, invest the time in writing that up formally. And the last thing we talked about, which is exciting for me because I'm a planner by trade, is um, uh, actually formalizing and making a digestible facilities upkeep plan and that name is a work in progress we haven't decided on the exact name of it yet um, but it'll be something along those lines they'll follow the construction of a traditional strategic plan where you have a mission which is a purpose for existence a vision which describes where you want to eventually be the core values and morals that guide the different prioritizations you have uh, the goals you want to accomplish, and then specifically the objectives as to how you're going to do that. And the good news is, is the objectives primarily already exist. Kate and Todd have done a great job of laying out how to spend money over the next several years so we can make sure that we're replacing things before they break, that our schools are staying safe and operational places that are optimal for learning so we're not running around when all of a sudden something goes bad, we've got a plan. Um, but what I think we really want to do in long range planning is, is formalize that a little more, bit more and, and dress it up for all the hard work that it is so that our community can see that our school district is working hard to make sure that their resources are used effectively and that we have efficient buildings that we can count on. Okay. Any discussion? Check. Negotiations? So that wants to be now, I guess. Oh, sorry. Um, so as we've said before, every time we have a negotiations update, it's a closed process and um, legally we're not allowed to share what uh, anything that goes on behind closed doors publicly. Um, Amy is continuing to lead the um, process with the SEA and our teachers. Um, it's ongoing, so we voted to keep her as the um, lead negotiator for that. And um, our first fact-finding session, um, which is a closed section session, but the date is scheduled on December 9th, um, which is Monday. 
Thank you. Hillary, just from a purely um, point of understanding, can you, can you tell me what fact find, like what that means? Like what is fact finding? Oh, um, well, I've never done it before. <laughs> but um, it's part of a process um, in negotiations. Um, I know. Do you, want, do you want me to jump in? The no, I, would, I mean, you can jump in. I'll just say, so typically um, you negotiate and you try to um, negotiate uh, in good faith as best you can. And if you have good faith disagreements that you can't, um, that you can't um, move beyond, you, um, you try a mediation process. Um, and we did that. That's with one mediator who kind of goes back and forth and learns all of the different issues on the different sides and tries to... Um, 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 you know, mediate and come to a come to a um, agreement for the two sides, um, and then and if that isn't if there's no agreement available through mediation, um, the next step is fact finding, and um, it's a little bit different than mediation because it's three uh, it's a panel of three people. There's a, a neutral party, and then there's um, an employee uh, advocate and an employer advocate, and um, basically, um, the two parties, um, they present what they are not able to agree upon, and then those three, that panel of three people um, get together. They can take, I think it's within 30 days, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, I think it's within 30 days. They go through that, um, they and they come up with some recommendations. Um, then it goes back to the parties, and they can either agree or agree to accept the recommendations or um, not accept the recommendations. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes, you did. The, that's in written format, right? The fact finding? Yes. yes. And, and at that point, that information is public. Right? Only uh, if both parties don't accept it. Right. If it's not accepted um, after two weeks, then the, um, the all the information becomes public. Okay. So that, that's it. So this is closed. If there's no... If, if there's no agreement something. reached, okay. which it, it, but one it, side it, could be okay, right? I just want to clarify mm -hmm. that after the fact finding um, session, the panel takes time to come up with a decision, um, releases a written report to the to the parties, and then uh, we have two weeks to go back and make any adjustments or go back to negotiation. If that doesn't work, then it can become public. Right. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Great. Finance. Um, so I'll give an eight corners update <coughs> later, but just real quick on the joint resolution. So at our last meeting, um, I gave you guys an update that we had come to a joint resolution on sort of our recommendations on how to move forward with budget goals uh, for this coming budget development cycle. Um, the whole point of that was that that was something that we would agree to, that was something that the Town Council Finance Committee had agreed to, and that we would sort of present those as our joint recommendations to our respective boards. Um, to my knowledge, they have not done that. It was not on the agenda last night. It is unclear to me as to why that was not on the agenda, um, but at this point, it, uh, my understanding is that it's being sent back to the new Finance Committee. So kind of defeats the purpose of it because it was a recommendation coming from the former finance committees who have done all that work to the new finance committees and in our case our committees aren't changing in their case it is um, so I don't I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't have to start from square one um, but we are where we are thank you liaison updates um, community center committee so two quick updates. Um, last night, the town council approved one to give the committee an extension. So on Monday night, uh, the developers are going to be presenting to the committee their proposal, their design proposal. Um, and then the committee is taking some time to get that, take, basically take that information and then they'll spec out what it would cost to do like a self-build. And so their recommendation will go to town council in late January. I don't know the exact date, but we'll get it for you guys. But it's been pushed from December to January. Um, and the other thing that they approved last night was um, the committee requested funds to be used for a market survey. 
and I think it was $18,000 that was approved that they're going to go ahead and execute uh, on. And that the data from that survey, I believe, will not be returned by the time that they have the, the presentation to town council, but it's the hope that town council would get that information and be able to use it to make a decision. Okay, thank you. Town council? So in addition to community center stuff that is relevant to us, um, the town council also made their committee assignments last night. Um, notably for us, um, the finance chair for the town council is going to be Councillor Hayes, and the um, communications chair will be Councillor Ken Johnson. Um, and so as chair of communications, I look forward to reaching out and, and hoping that we can get some more joint meetings um, on the calendar. And then uh, they also named their liaison to the BOE, and that will be Councillor Gleistein. And then and, vocational? And then for the vocational update, um, I, I'm always so impressed, and you guys know, like, this is my, I love this liaison role. Um, and so this most recent meeting was held in the cafeteria, uh, the new cafe, and the students made us an amazing meal um, and they lay out everything so beautifully and it's like white glove service what these kids do for us just for this meeting um, and so I wanted to give you um, an enrollment update um, we currently send 32 students to Westbrook and we send 19 students to paths um, the state right now is really kind of trying to put a lot of focus and energy on increasing enrollment in these programs um, and getting student ready, students ready for careers um, after high school. And so I personally, as an advocate and liaison to this um, committee, like I would love to see um, more of a push for Scarborough students. Um, and so I've actually on our kind of working document for workshops, I've actually requested that um, someone from the guidance department at the high school come um, and maybe give us a workshop and further explain like all of the services and the opportunities that these um, CTE centers provide our students. And then lastly, and I apologize because I have to have my phone out, um, one of our students was recognized as student of the month. And I took a picture of the bulletin board. I'm sorry, I don't have it up. Okay, you'll have to come back to me. Okay. <laughs> Except I'm last. <laughs> okay. Um, I've done this. Moving into new business, the appointments. 8.1.1, .1, the high school winter coaches. Um, we were all received the documents um, with our packets and the motion is to approve the high school winter coaches as presented So moved second Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous fantastic 8.1.2 the middle school unified club advisors um, The motion is to accept the club advisors as presented So moved second any discussion and all those in favor? Unanimous. 8.1.3, Middle School Unified Basketball Coach. Um, the motion is to accept Scott Weymouth as presented as the Middle School Unified Basketball Coach. So moved. Second. Again, any discussion? And all those in favor? Excellent. All right, 8.4, Eight Corners Project Financial Update, and I'll get to the slide. Can I jump in while you're looking? Of course you can. Okay, so our student of the month, um, his name is Matt Hale, and he's in the Landscape and Gardens program. It says, Matt is a very talented person who is able to do anything we need and helps everyone. He is a second year student and has been a huge asset to our program for two years. His visual spatial reasoning skills are outstanding and he creates masterful art in the form of stone sculptures, flower arrangements, and gardens. He is our go-to person for technological assistance. He is a one, and he is one of the kindest people I know. And there was a lovely picture of him um, on their bulletin board. So I wanted to share that with you guys. That's awesome. Uh, that was it. Um, Paths. Cool. 
Um, oh no, it's so small. Okay, so um, as you guys all know, the Eight Corners project is complete. Um, just as a, a little reminder, earlier this year, um, when we put together the the budget for the project, um, we decided as a as a board that it was appropriate to go to town council to ask for the the uh, this to be covered out of the school impact fees, which is a fund um, that it basically addresses growth in town. So any structural building um, or any, I have the language specifically in here um, that we can look at. Um, financing and facility improvements with which the town council has determined are made necessary by new development. So we felt that the growth at eight corners due to enrollment um, fell under uh, this appropriately. And town council agreed um, and voted for us to approve $260,000 to be used for the eight corner project. Um, that $260,000 and the budget for that was for the uh, single portable unit that was two classrooms. Um, site prep for two units. So if you remember, we have uh, one of those units in the budget for this year so that we could proactively order it for next year if we needed it. Um, which it sounds like we will, um, and then a connector from the portable to the classroom. Um, so pretty low, I mean, a uh, pretty small font, but the, the summary is that we're over by almost $64,000. Um, the bulk of that overage came from, um, and Kate, feel free to chime in if I'm off here by anything, um, by unplanned sewer impact fees. So uh, as Todd would explain it, the uh, I think the secretary of the sanitary district uh, went to, he got approval by the planning board pending approval by the, a visit by the sanitary district secretary. <coughs> they went and saw eight corners and at that point noticed that we had had, already had existing portables there that had not been, the fees had not been collected by, however many years ago those were put in. So the um, thirteen thousand dollars that you see up there is basically basically retroactively charging us for not paying the sanitary fees for the portables that had been there for so long. So that was something that we could not have planned for. Um, it was unfortunate the timing, but that was where the majority of that cost came from. Um, the sprinkler system, so there was a visit by the fire marshal, um, and due to, I, I believe, the proximity of the modulars to the school, it required us to basically put a sprinkler system into the ceiling. So there's like a sprinkler system, drop down ceilings, and then the classroom, and it required that we put a sprinkler system above that, which was, again, was something that um, we had not planned for and was a significant cost to add um, that water, to add a, like piping for that as well. And the two other additional items, so the connector was just under budget for, um, and as a complete oversight, uh, the building itself is, is ADA um, acceptable, but the handicraft ramp was not uh, considered in the original cost projections. So that's where the bulk of the overage comes from, um, bring our balance to about $64,000. Pause there if you guys have any questions. And we've reviewed this ad nauseum, so if you guys don't have questions, for the public, anyone who's watching, if they don't have questions, that's why. So ultimately, it's the recommendation of the Finance Committee um, and I believe the Long Range Planning Committee that we go to Town Council and ask for this to be funded out of impact fees. Um, Kate has done a lot of work. Um, to basically assess whether or not if they say no, can we actually fund this on our own? The answer to that is yes, but it is not without impact. So we'll, we will have to take the funds out of existing CIP um, projects, which basically just puts us at risk if, the, if things fail. And will will prevent us from doing some sort of preventative maintenance um, that's already planned. And I just have a link to the ordinance in there. So I think um, the move would, the motion would be to vote to approve us going in front of town council um, to request that the overage of this be covered by impact fees. Is there town council no that this request is on? As liaison, I have talked to several town councilors about this. So they, not everyone, but 
at the very least the chair and vice chair are aware. Um, just out of procedural? Yes. Uh, there is a motion on the table, yes. so before we can have discussion, can Mo there be a second? Move to approve. Thank you. And now we need a second. Second. Excellent. Now we can have the discussion. <laughs> yeah, I think Alyssa just add to that. Um, I think we've intentionally been very transparent about this from the beginning. The original projections were estimates, and we knew that. And so at multiple occasions, we've been giving updates, not only for the Finance Committee, but also at our joint meetings. Yeah, joint meetings. Um, so we did already present the overage to the, the Town Council Finance Committee. They were the ones that actually asked us to go ahead and say, well, if we say no, how would you cover this? Which is why we did that work. So the next step, assuming that we approve it, would be to go in front of them and, and make that uh, presentation as well. Well, and just as an additional safety piece, just to make sure they knew, uh, Chairman Johnson actually sat in the periphery of our Long Range Planning Committee yesterday where we had this very discussion. So he is at least aware of it. Uh, the only other comment is really just for the folks at home, the impact fees, even though they are earmarked for the schools and it is technically school money, town council does kind of hold the purse string. So we do need to ask them um, for use of that money, which is why the motion is going into in front of town council asking to get to the money that is earmarked for the school. So, with that said, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? And unanimous. Excellent. And then the last item tonight is 8.5. It's the motion for accepting going for the RFQ um, as discussed in the workshop tonight. I formally say that yes, um, make the motion to move to RFQ as requested by the Building Steering Committee. So moved. Second. Okay. And discussion. One of the things that I like that they pointed out when they were just uh, when they were um, they were talking tonight is they talked about the importance of looking at your design firms based on their credentials and not necessarily the price. And I think that that's sometimes a misunderstanding when people think about state projects. That some people's eyes get big and they go, "Oh God, we're going to do this as cheap as possible." And what I loved is that they presented tonight that this RFQ process is really about finding a firm or firms that are the best qualified to carry this out for our town. And so I was really glad they emphasized that for us. I just wanted to say thanks to Hillary and Alicia. I think the mm. presentation that was given tonight was pretty spot on. Um, and so appreciate your guys' guidance and helping them develop that in your time. Definitely. The yes, committee is you. just amazing. I mean, there, yeah. there are so many experts in their field, and we're so lucky. Yeah. To I mean, have they them didn't go into their credentials, but they're all like landscape. And they kept saying, in my, you know, they're all landscape architects, structural architects. I mean, they do this all the time. So. I feel really comfortable with their knowledge of the process. Um, and they've helped me a lot to understand some of the stuff that I wouldn't normally understand. Like, no, you guys like, the whole RFQ process, I feel like I can. Uh, and to that level, um, thank you for getting me through that because hearing the term RFQ from a business perspective, I'm assuming that's a quote. That means we've made a decision. Um, and if you did not tune in to hear about the workshop, um, it is the cue for qualifications, whether or not these firms can do business with a school. Um, so it is a state mandated process um, that we'll be following for this. And I'll just say again, just again, in case anybody wasn't um, um, able to tune into the workshop, that um, this RFQ is, uh, re is a request for qualifications um, and it's able to be written generally enough so that we can um, safely put it, publicize it without um, making, having made a final decision on what type of project we're gonna go forward with. Um, so yeah. If you want more information about it, rewind and go back <laughs> to the workshop because the, the um, the experts that we have on our committee did a really nice job explaining that. They did. All right. All that said, all those in favor? Unanimous. Um, before we adjourn, just a reminder that the workshop on Thursday the 19th is going to be a public forum to share your thoughts on whether we should have a consolidated school or we should be looking at renovating our three um, primary schools. So please do come. That will be from 6 to 7. And for that, motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks.